begins with Z, Generation Z's quest for a clean future. I'm Amy Tanzillo, Workplace Marketing Coordinator here at Knoll. And as a reminder, this Cake Talk will be recorded and posted online. If you have any questions for our panel, please submit them into the Q&A box on your screen. We'll be taking questions from the audience at the end of the discussion. So with that, I'd like to hand things off to Kimberly Smith, our Senior Director of Workplace Strategy at Knoll, who'll be moderating our discussion today. Kimberly, please take it away. Excellent. Thank you, Amy. And thank you all for joining us today for our August 2021 K-Talk, where we will discuss with two very special guests our journey to net zero. But before I introduce our panelists that we have here and you'll see on your screen today, I want you to think back to 2019 when a member of Generation Z, Greta Thunberg, a Swedish schoolgirl who inspired a global movement to fight climate change. She was named Time Magazine's Person of the Year, and the 16-year-old at the time was the youngest person to be chosen by the magazine in the tradition that started way back in 1927. This notable honor for Greta has shed a brighter light on environmental issues to a broader audience, all because one member of Generation Z started an environmental strike by missing her school lessons most Fridays in 2018 to protest outside the Swedish parliament building. It sparked a worldwide movement that became popular with the hashtag Fridays for Future. And as our K-Talk title suggests, zero begins with Z, supporting Generation Z's quest for a clean future. So as individuals, communities, companies, and cities increasingly turn their focus to improving the environment, we'll explore how we prioritize our commitment to carbon reduction and align a common approach to move this mission forward. And today, we will uncover some strategies that trailblazing organizations such as St. Gobain are taking to protect the planet for generations to come. This call to action in contributing to climate change is getting louder and louder with the world's top climate scientists warning that the planet will warm by 1.5 degrees Celsius in the next two decades without drastic moves to eliminate the greenhouse gas emissions and pollution. And with the latest publications this week from the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change or IPCC, as everyone knows, um, for the first time, they really linked the human activity that's associated with these rising temperatures. So one can really not ignore the cries for help to save the planet. People have often turned a blind eye individually, perhaps because it feels um, like an unbearable thing to burden alone. But everyone across the globe is really taking notice of the considerable increase in extreme weather events in recent years, from tornadoes, severe thunderstorms with hail, tropical storms and hurricanes, flash flooding, and wildfire, wildfires, ones that get their own names and are burning record-breaking acreage that we are losing with every passing year. So in fact, we're welcoming a workforce with a generation where Hurricane Katrina may be one of their first memories. Hurricane Katrina, if you remember, in August of 2005, where you may remember that our country sustained 1,833 fatalities and an enormous figure of $170 billion in damages. So let's be sure to connect the dots on why all of this is so important. Every degree of temperature increase leads to about 1% loss in the GDP. And extreme weather impacts our food security due to crop devastation and productivity losses. But in spite of all this grave danger with the severity of the climate crisis, most activists remain optimistic. And the two that we have here today certainly are in that camp. So we've heard this calling and are making strides toward improvement. And according to Deloitte's 2021 Renewable Energy Industry Outlook, renewable growth may accelerate in 2021 as the new administration starts to execute on a platform that includes rejoining the Paris Climate Accord 
investing $2 trillion in clean energy and fully decarbonizing the power sector by 2035 in order to achieve the larger goal of net zero carbon emissions by 2050. So you're gonna hear years that we're gonna talk about. We're gonna have Michael and Dennis talk a little bit about the cities that they work with as well as the companies and just sort of get a sense on where people's targets are. So we look to buildings and communities to really see how we can achieve these goals. As commercial real estate giant Jones Lang LaSalle reported, or JLL, during their responsible real estate decarbonizing the built environment about the importance of partnerships in cities. It really is the secret to success and why we asked Dr. Michael Shank to join us today, um, recognizing challenges, but also talking about some encouraging signs. You know, the opportunity or challenge is that 29% strongly agree that top tier cities are taking significant bold action to mitigate climate risk. But when we hear a number in percentages at 29%, we know that that's only a third of 100%. So we know there is real opportunity there. And really an even broader view that in the January 1st article that's found in the BBC that was entitled Why 2021 Could Be a Turning Point for Tackling Climate Change, where the author from BBC cites five great reasons, beginning with the importance of crucial climate conference, that in November of 2021 this year, world leaders will be gathering again in Glasgow for the successor to the landmark Paris meeting that happened back in 2015. So all of this to raise awareness and inspire change and so much more. There's so much to really unpack but let's start with listening and learning from the thought leaders that we have invited to be our guests today. Dr. Michael Schenk, who is a Director of Communications for Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance, and Dennis Wilson, who is the Vice President of Sustainability and EHS at saint -Gobain, North America. Uh, welcome, gentlemen. And please take a moment to introduce yourself and share with our audience a little bit about the work that you're doing in our journey to net zero. Michael, you want to share your screen? Yes, I do. And greetings, everyone. Kimberly, thank you so much for hosting us. And thank you for that great introduction to the world we face right now and the IPCC report and all that it means for us in our work. All right, so let me just get this queued up. Here we are. Okay, so the Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance, you may not have ever heard of us. I'm thrilled that Kimberly found us. We are a very small global nonprofit. We work with the Vanguard cities out there, the Oslos, the Londons, the New York cities, the Seattles, the Melbournes, the Sydneys, the cities that early on committed to carbon neutrality by 2050 years ago. So our cities, the Copenhagens, uh, the Helsinki's, our cities came out of the gate early in the climate fight especially among subnational actors, urban actors, cities specifically here, with aggressive goal setting back then. It was ambitious and set, really set the stage for what goal setting needs to look like around carbon neutrality, net zero, fill in the blank by 2050. Now, our cities have since said, whoa, 2050 is too late. And in fact, we need to be reaching carbon neutrality by 2030, 2040. Copenhagen has set goals for carbon neutrality by 2025, which are super aggressive. And they're now like, <laughs> how do we get there? But that's the kind of goal setting we need. And the Code Red report that came out this week from the UN, and I'm quoting Antonio Guterres, who's the UN Secretary General in terms of Code Red, shows that we do need aggressive goal setting. And so I'll speak to some of the work our cities are doing in decarbonizing their sectors and then some of the challenges they face. And I look forward to then baton passing to Dennis and hearing about what the uh, business community is doing, especially in the building sector and how we can work together and partner together. So I'm thrilled to be with all of you here today. Let me just tick through some images in terms of our game changers. So our cities have taken on what, what they call um, game changers. And if you wanna check out our website, carbonneutralcities.org, this is just the landing page for that. You'll see all the game changers there. I'm not gonna go through all of them now. I've picked a few that I think are illustrative of both the challenge in decarbonizing a sector and the challenge in winning the hearts and minds. So I've written a lot on, and I'll put in the chat later, 
some work on behavior change because I feel strongly that we need both systems change and behavior change. There is a debate in the climate world among thought leaders. No, it's only systems that need to decarbonize. And I feel very strongly that we need to couple that, of course, with behavior change because that's going to create the demand for the business sector to change, for municipalities to change. We need consumers both changing their own behaviors, but also demanding that of systems too. So it's both and for me, and that's what I'll stress throughout. Okay, so zero carbon buildings. Vancouver, one of our members, came out early years ago with this goal setting around zero emission buildings. And I'm, I'm guessing some of what you see here is old news to, to those of you watching. But what's, what's interesting about this space, if I went up to a policymaker or a member of the public or a member of the press and talked about zero carbon buildings, I think they would intuitively understand what that might mean, but they may not be able to enumerate all that you see here. And so as we get into the decarbonation, uh, decarbonation, see, I can't even pronounce it, uh, deep decarbonization space, net zero space, carbon neutrality space, how do we win the hearts and minds? How do we build the public and political will and the press will to move this forward, especially if people aren't able to articulate building deep decarbonization work like they might be able to talk about emissions from a car, for example, or a coal plant, for example. A lot of the work that's been tackled so far in the climate space is stuff that's obvious, stuff you can see. I get emissions coming out of a car. I can see it. I get emissions coming out of a power plant. I can see it. Buildings, well, now that we're cutting some of the dirtiest oil, like in New York City, that used to burn and you could see it, now that buildings aren't as visible as they once were in terms of their carbon impact, carbon footprint, how do we talk about deep decarbonization in ways that can build the public and political will? And so what I'm encouraging with my cities, and I just want to give up some uh, here, some examples of exemplary thought leadership, building of public and political will. New York City, those of you who've been to New York City know that their restaurants have a grade, A, B, C, D. And before you go into that restaurant, if it's got a D or an F, you probably don't want to go into it because it's not clean and you're, coming, you're going to come away sick. Same with their buildings, they just mirrored that. And let's let's they decided let's grade this, the city building similar to how we grade the city restaurants so that people can see very clearly how energy efficient the city buildings are. And what I love about this, it sends a clear message to build the public and political will around greener buildings, more efficient buildings. And so how do we message to the public in ways that they can quickly understand if they're not using the zero emissions language? Similarly, and this is what I'll stress throughout, is how do we make this work beautiful? How do we make quality of life better? How do we ensure that people are living healthier lives, working in healthier buildings, being more efficient, more productive, because the building is healthier for them? How do we stress that? Because they may not care about the carbon footprint. They may not care about the IPCC report, but they do care about working in a nice place. I work here at home. I look to the left. I see forest. I look to the right. I see forest. I got my animals behind me, which you can't see. I have good quality quality of life and how do we give that to our workers, to our workplace so that life is better because that's going to motivate the switch. We know that we need to electrify our buildings as one example. Well, what does that mean and how do we build public and political will around that? This is just a slide out of New Jersey talking about the goal setting that needs to happen in electrifying buildings, getting buildings off gas and oil, for example. And while I could go into a deep dive with the public, all right, this is what electrification means. This is what it looks like. You've got energy independence. My house here is energy secure. I've got a bunch of solar to the left. I've got Tesla Powerwall batteries and I've got heat pumps. So when power outages come to Vermont, which they do increasingly, I'm energy secure. Now I can talk about energy security and energy independence in ways that Vermonters understand and appreciate. I'm not gonna go into this visual here because that's not gonna mean a lot to them as much as the story around energy security and energy independence and this. So when we talk about electrifying buildings, are we talking about more comfort, less maintenance? It's safer, it's emissions free, and it's cheaper. How do we sell these quality of life benefits, economic, health, security, so that people get it quickly versus, again, the deep decarbonization, deep dive? This is out of Boulder. Boulder is one of our members and just shows you kind of these virtual power plants that are being set up all throughout the city. Yokohama is another one of our members. And again, they're setting up these virtual power plants all across the city so that when the regional grid goes down, these buildings are safe and secure because they've got power, they've got backup, they've got battery, et cetera. So how do we sell those benefits? Another game changer that our cities are looking at is what you see here, congestion charging, ultra low emission zones. And again, how do we sell the benefits of that? Because a lot of people, certainly in the United States, don't wanna be restricted, don't want their freedoms taken from us. 
And when you see signs like this, it feels restrictive. Like my freedoms are being taken from me. If you charge me for driving, I wanna drive where I wanna drive. How dare you charge me for that? So again, how do we sell the benefits of cities that have fewer cars coming into them? What is life like? And how do we, how do we show this? These are some pictures during COVID when city landscapes really changed and cities rightly took advantage of the moment to create new environments that people then didn't want to lose. They created attachment so that people were like, no, 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 I liked what we had during COVID. Let's, let's not give that up. And you, st you start seeing more of this where we're taking over city centers so that they're pedestrian centric and we're making sure that people are enjoying it so they don't want to give it up. New York City has done it. One of our members has done a good job of slowly taking over space. And what they'll say is that they're going to pilot it for a couple months. We'll just pilot this for three months. So people are like, OK, well, my restriction on my, my rights to drive through New York City aren't inhibited long term because it's a pilot. It's three months. But then people get attached. They like it. Oh, they're like, oh, we love this piazza. We love the closet. We don't want to give it up. So in thinking about behavior change, some of this piloting is helpful. If it's impermanent, people get attached and then they don't want to give it up. Embodied carbon, a big one that our cities are tackling in Europe and increasingly in the United States. How do we talk about all this? Am I going to explain to the public or the policymakers or the press this whole chronology of where carbon is kind of baked into our building materials? No, probably not. Yes, I can do it simply in this visual is helpful in that regard. Or I can just show them beautiful pictures of what life is like under uh, a new understanding of what buildings can and look like in terms of uh, being less carbon intensive. And so when I think, and we're tackling this now, I don't have all the answers when it comes to embodied carbon, but our, our European members European cities are tackling this now in terms of how do we talk to people about embodied carbon that doesn't necessarily get into too much of the deep details on this and really shows how life is going to be better, how quality of the workplace is going to be more enjoyable. Another thing our cities are tackling in terms of game changers, the climate justice, climate equity issue, you know, a lot of a lot of dirty power is located in communities of color and low income communities. And so how do we change that? And how do we make life better for communities of color, low-income communities that have had power plants in their backyards? How do we make the health of, of their communities, um, the air quality better? And so this is something we're tackling too. And this really comes down to, again, changing our cityscapes and our buildings so that they're healthier for everyone. Mm -hmm. Couple more really quickly here in terms of resilience and adaptation. A lot of our cities are seeing flooding because of sea level rise and storm surge. And again, when you're communicating this to the public, we tend to speak defensively, yeah, we'll build a wall, but how do we create cityscapes so that they're beautiful? So that when people have to come to terms with a retreat, I remember, uh, Mayor Bloomberg, when he was mayor with Hurricane Sandy, Superstorm Sandy, he talked about never retreating. And some of the sustainability staff at the time were like, no, don't say that because we actually have to retreat. But Americans don't like to retreat. It's a sign of defeat. So how do you how do you create resilient, adaptive uh, coastal zones in cities, recognizing that people are going to have to move away from those flood zones, but how do you create beautiful environments so that people are attracted? How is quality of life gonna be better under this more resilient, uh, absorbent cityscape so that flood zones uh, aren't impacting buildings like they once were? So this is just some of the stuff our cities are, are thinking about as they're becoming more resilient. Lastly, and I'll put this in chat, this is, this is the behavior change I'm thinking a lot about, uh, and I'll include some links to articles I'm writing on this. This came out of ideas42.org. They're a behavioral science firm in Boston. And I, I put on this, I layered on this, some of our climate communications work, because these are all, what you see here are all either obstacles or opportunities in terms of winning the hearts and minds around this work. And I'll give two quick examples around hassle factors. That's one that you saw on the previous slide. This is out of Helsinki. They have made it super easy to get rid of waste. If you're walking through Helsinki, and those of you who have had an opportunity to do it, I love doing it because these little vacuums suck back to a central plant that then distributes all of what you see here, paper, cartons, glass, trash, food waste. And so how do we make it easy thinking about hassle factors that could get in the way of the behavior change that we want to see in cities? Yeah. One more social norming. And I've shared this with Kimberly and Dennis previously. This was out of Sydney where they were trying to green their buildings, mindful of social norming that we will do what our neighbors are doing. If we see them doing it, we will want to outcompete them. Same in the, in the business space. And here they were very public about the leaderboard. 
So you could see KPMG, Domain, Brookfield, JLL, Fraser's Property, who was leading in the building greening space and then you want to outcompete them. Simple measures to create social norming within our sectors, super helpful in terms of motivating the race to net zero, whatever racing to. All right, that's it for me. I'm gonna back out now and stop share. <laughs> you are connecting so people about. through competition. I love it. It's really the oftentimes the only way to get someone to act in our culture is sort of connecting people through competition. So thank you, Michael. All of those are such amazing things to think about. Um, so if you could share some of the things you mentioned in the chat, of course, I have a million questions, but I'll hold them till a little bit later on a lot of the documents that you shared. Uh, and we'll give a little bit of airspace to Dennis for him to share a little bit about Saint-Gobain and what you guys are doing in the market as a maker of building materials. You're a really important partner for us to share your story today. So Dennis, take it away. Sure. Thanks, Kimberly. And thanks, Michael. So I'm just going to go through uh, real quickly. Um, Kimberly mentioned my name is Dennis Wilson. I'm the Vice President of Sustainability and Environmental Health and Safety for St. Coban in North America. Um, you know, I wanted to kind of circle back a little bit to something that, uh, that Kimberly talked about at the beginning. Um, hopefully this is, this is playing on your screen. Um, yes, we're good. It's full screen. Yeah. Yep. You know, that IPCC report that came out, you know, we, we are at a point where we can no longer stop global warming from intensifying over the next 30 years. And we have this really short window to prevent the most severe impacts. Um, so, you know, we as humans have already heated the climate up to about 1.1 degrees Celsius or two degrees Fahrenheit since February, uh, since, the, since the 19th century. Even if nations started sharply cutting emissions right now, today, global warming is likely to, to rise about 1.5 degrees Celsius within the next two decades. And that's locked in. So, and we know that 1.5 degrees Celsius is not a, not a great place. So this is a very urgent thing. And, you know, one of the things that I try and get across to, to our company in North America is, you know, I work for this company for a reason, because really this, this climate, these, these, uh, you know, issues in society are really our business. So you throw this on top of some of the emerging trends. Um, you know, we are the largest building products company in the world. About 40% of global emissions, global greenhouse gas emissions come from, from buildings. So with that, uh, op, with, with that responsibility also uh, comes opportunity. And I'm gonna talk about some of the things that, that we're doing. Other trends that we're seeing, nearly 70% of the world's population lives in cities or will live in cities by 2050. We know we will see resource scarcity. Um, that'll increase by 50% out to 2030. New opportunities with digitalization. Michael talked a little bit about this. Uh, new mobilities, a, a move to electric and driverless vehicles. Uh, de demographic changes, lots of things happening that, again, prevent, present challenges to society, but also pre present opportunities uh, to, to companies that are out there. So one of the reasons why, why I work there and, and at Psychoban and, and enjoy working for this company is, is really our scale. If you're unfamiliar with us, we're a 350-year-old uh, building products company. We started out off with the, the Hall of Mirrors in the Palace of Versailles. Uh, so our letter of incorporation for our company is actually signed by Louis XIV. Um, we're in 70 countries, 167,000 employees, about 800 manufacturing facilities. With that comes great impact. So largely, whenever you hear the topic of uh, embodied carbon, that's coming from our supply chain and from the, the products that we make and sell into the market. And we're doing things like melting sand and cooking rock in order to make insulation and make gypsum and all these other kind of things. So those are really big impact things, but also really big opportunities for us to both reduce our impact as well as helping uh, reduce the impact of our customers. So these are the markets that we manufacture, distribute um, solutions into housing, transportation, infrastructure, buildings, healthcare, industrial applications. Um, these are all challenges of, of sustainable construction, resource efficiency, and our, and our collective fight against climate change. So we think that we're well positioned to be able to, to deal with these things. 85% of our sales come from the construction market. Um, and as you can see, 48% of that comes from reno renovation. So again, a lot of opportunity in helping buildings decarbonize uh, retrofit solu solutions to help people uh, reduce energy. Um, we have a unique a portfolio of products to be able to help um, our customers in buildings, but also the manufacturing facilities that create those products in our high performance solutions uh, products. Overall, our goal is to be the worldwide reference in sustainable construction 
um, you know, improving the live through, uh, lives through the daily performance of solutions. And that leads us to our new purpose as a company. And, and you know, I've described sort of our overall product portfolio to you. Um, we are really trying to make the world a better home. You know, just to kind of, uh, you know, go off of some things that, that Kimberly and Michael said, Kimberly mentioned Greta Thunberg was, was uh, Times Person of the Year a few years ago. Greta Thunberg is our employee at this point. Uh, she's our investor, she's our customer. She's the neighbor that lives next to the plant. All of these people expect us to do more than what we're doing, not to just be a company and put solutions out there that don't you know, lessen the issues that we're all dealing with uh, as a company. So this is really why I work uh, for, for this company is because it's our job to help reduce those, those impacts. And when we define those impacts, we define them in many ways. Yes, we're talking about carbon. That's the most um, important issue that, that we have out there. But um, things like, like gender equality also fit into that bucket for us. Um, making sure that there's a good social safety net for our employees around the world, whether they live in a country where you get time off, pay time off for um, you know, maternity, paternity leave, th those kind of things. Um, having paid time off to be able to visit a, a sick loved one in the hospital, making sure that those are norms across the world, as opposed to just in countries where that is the norm. Um, I mentioned, uh, you know, the impact of the building space through things like circular economy, through things like resource efficiency, avoiding uh, extracting raw materials out of the ground in order to be able to make, make our products. And you can see 10.1 million Version natural raw materials um, avoided from being extracted in 2020. Purchasing agreements in place so that we're not doing things like buying uh, endangered lumber from forests that should have never been cut down to begin with. So making sure that that's in our policies of our company. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this, but we've set a carbon neutrality goal by 2050. Uh, and for a company that does things like cook rock, melt sand, that's a big number, right? All the offenders, some of the, right? Yeah, exactly. All the things exactly. that could be an offender if you are not a sustainable manufacturer. <laughs> exactly. So, so and those are things that we use a lot of thermal energy that it will take us time to be able to do that. We just signed a very large renewable energy deal uh, in the recent past that covers 40% of our uh, electricity emissions in North America. Um, we, we hope to go further. Um, and, uh, you know, reducing the actual impact of the plant that the energy is, um, is going to. Um, along the same lines. Safety is also very important to us as well. So, you know, I would say this is a multi-pronged approach to us getting to what net zero means. And it means being a company that people want to work with, live next to, buy things from, all of those, all of those things. So just, you know, to go a little bit further into the substance, we've, we've got two categories here. Solutions we're providing on a, you know, in the way of sustainability to our customers and internally, um, as it relates to our, 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 our processes. I'm gonna start on the process side of things because every single one of our businesses has put together a roadmap to get to 2050, right? So what, where are the big impact um, aspects of our, of our business? Where are we using the waste, uh, creating the most waste? Where are we using the most energy? Where are our emissions the worst based on the energy mix, mix that they may be pulling from, from wherever the plant is? Um, we put in place a, an internal price on carbon um, we are a European company. We've got some larger requirements from a dis disclosure perspective for non-financial in indicators. So this is information that gets reported right alongside financial information for, for our company on an annual basis. So our internal price on carbon is um, 50 euros per ton for any capital project um, improvements and 150 euros per ton for, for um, R&D. And we have 2030 targets that are science-based targets that have been validated. Uh, going out to 2030, our goal is minus 33% for scope one and scope two, and then minus 16% for, for scope three. And, and for a, a company that makes as many things as, as we do, this scope three exercise, which we've recently gone through, is, is quite, the, quite the challenge, trying to find out information on all the raw materials and the carbon that's, that's associated with all those, uh, those raw materials. And then, of course, going out to 2050, making sure that we um, are, are carbon neutral by that time. One thing I want to mention about this, uh, Michael mentioned competition. Um, we do have a, I mentioned this when we, when we met earlier, we do have a competition amongst our plants in North America where we give uh, WWE championship belts to the plants <laughs> that have the best uh, performance when it comes to waste, uh, waste, water, energy. They make sort of smack talk videos with one another in order to be able to like 
raise the level of competition between the plants to make sure that they're, uh, you know, they're having a little bit of fun as they're reducing impacts along yeah. the way. It's been a pretty successful program for us. On the product side of things, um, you know, decarbonizing the products that that we are putting um, out there for our customers. And body carbon is a big focus for us. Um, we were one of the, the early um, uh, supporters of the EC3 tool, the embodied carbon calculator for construction tool, um, lightweighting materials, um, something like insulation, for instance, it's a material that uses a has a lot of uh, impact and that it takes a lot of energy to create the product, but it recoups the amount of energy that goes into it in the first three months um, use of that product. So really important, um, uh, you know, product as it relates to sustainability. And last year, the insulation that we made offset about one point um, 1,200 metric tons of uh, CO2 equivalent. Um, and then lastly, on that, on the decarbonization of industry type of thing, we make things that go into other people's products, things that go into turbines, things that go into cars, um, things that go into airplane engines, uh, furnaces, things that need to be very durable, last a long time, be able to hold up to very severe environments. So we are part of the, the carbon story of our customers on the industrial side of, of things and hopefully reduce that number on, on the manufacturer side as well. And then I just, a couple of things I wanted to show here, um, some, some projects that we've been involved in across the world. Uh, the one in the bottom center is the new tower that we have in uh, just outside of Paris, that's our headquarters. Um, has every building certification you could possibly think of at the moment. Um, so very, very proud of these projects, um, all with a focus on um, energy de decarbonization. Um, if you are, live in the Pennsylvania area, you would know our North American headquarters in Malvern, Pennsylvania is uh, double lead uh, platinum certified uh, for commercial interiors and um, core and shell. Uh, so this is a picture of the the headquarters where in normal times I would would office. Um, also, this is the front page to a product that we use called Ecomedes. Ecomedes is where you can find all of our, our information as it relates to building rating systems, um, any kind of certifications or other eco labels that, that we have. Um, so something that, that we're very proud of and a place where you can go and find out more, further information of our products. So I will go ahead and stop there and turn it back over to you, Kimberly. Excellent so many things to unpack and talk about here today. Uh, one thing I thought about, uh, and you know, the age old question about disposal, Dennis, when we were, you were talking about insulation, right? We always think in terms of like what it does once it's in, but what do you do with it when you're replacing it? So you talked about, you know, sort of retrofitting older buildings. So are you committed to thinking about the total life cycle and maybe sort of energy from waste facilities or something like that, that would sort of drive the whole holistic approach to projects? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in other parts of the world, um, insulation is is something that we can we can really the only technical issue behind taking insulation back is number one, transporting it because it's a very light uh, material, getting it back to a plant and making it into something else. Um, it, it's just a very expensive. Um, yeah, in transportation costs yeah. and labor, probably labor as well, right? Right, and and also knowing what's in that material, depending on the age of the building and what else might might be in the building. Um, that being said, in other parts of the world, we we are starting to do this to some extent, um, right? Learning how to do this over time, developing the technology to be able to do it. It really isn't so much of a technical issue because it can be remelted. And one thing that I didn't mention when I talked about insulation is the embodied energy it takes to produce insulation actually goes down when you use recycled material like, like cullet, right? It takes less energy to melt cullet than it does to melt virgin materials that you would use to make glass. So in the long term, from an energy CO2 perspective, it's actually in our best interest to be able to do that. It's just technically figuring out the sort of the reverse supply chain and the, and the cost that's associated with those things. But we are actively working on those as well as things like gypsum, roofing materials, uh, you name it. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's fascinating the exploration, you know, that we yes. can inspire a generation to really move in that direction. So, Absolutely. Um, so if we think in terms of um, companies like you just shared for Saint Gobain, how to help them create meaningful climate goals? You know, how can municipalities sort of layer into that? So, Michael, I know you deal a lot with cities from a big picture perspective, and I just wonder, you know, from a environmental obligations perspective with municipalities and corporations, 
how do we get to a point of making sure that they're all aligned and is there really room for collaboration, let's say? Well, one thing I'll contribute uh, as a communicator where I have pushed before in previous jobs when I used to work for Climate Nexus, which is a pro bono PR firm for climate communicators. We supported a lot of, of business groups like We Mean Business and the B Team. So We Mean Business Coalition, if you just Google them, they've committed to some pretty impressive climate targets, the B Team.org similarly. And when working with them and cities in the Climate Nexus capacity, serving climate communicators uh, one thing i wanted to see more of and still do now working with the carbon neutral cities alliance is partnership and thought leadership so i'm not going to speak to the technical partnership like dennis could and will but i i do think we need more where possible subnationals coming together partnering together leading together in thought leadership and again in terms of winning the hearts and minds building the public and political will it's very powerful when a ceo and a governor from the u.s context governor or mayor come together and thought lead together whether it's in the political capitals or in the press and i think we just have so much more opportunities that we're not seizing to do that because that's powerful. And so I recognize there's some PR limitations there. There's some political bureaucratic limitations there in terms of how that gets out the door. But when it does, I think it's very powerful. Amazing. And the Carbon Neutral uh, Cities Alliance, you've been around for how many years? We've over five years, we're, we're young. And the reason why we fill a, a niche role is that there are plenty of city organizations out there. Some of you might be familiar with C40, which is 100 cities around the world, ICLE, which is even more. We're really set up to provide peer learning from city to city where, where sustainability directors and climate leads can come together and problem solve together in a safe space versus C40, which helping mayors do the political work they need to do to win the hearts and minds on the on the global scale this is more of a kind of internal peer learning space amazing which i think really helps people answer and solve uh real solutions yeah. when they come together with shared experiences some best practices for something that might have worked in a community that might be the same or city city i should say that might be similar size similar scale etc and the one i thought was really interesting and i wanted to ask you the question about where it was, was the city congestion where you had that tax sort of, it looked like they had the opportunity to tax someone for driving on the roads. I wanted to yeah, sort of so, hear a little yeah. more about that. Yeah, that, that was out of London and more and more cities took advantage of COVID to take over roads uh, in, in new ways, which was great. But London definitely did that. Uh, new York City, as folks may know, depending where they're calling in from, also a couple of years ago announced the desire for some kind of congestion pricing scheme. And at the time I was texting with some of the staff there saying, hey, do you have a campaign to accompany this because we wanna win the hearts and minds? And they recognized that they didn't, but as we saw for anyone who tracked that, there was definitely blowback. Blow back. New Jersey was like, we don't wanna get taxed. And taxis were like, we don't wanna get taxed. And everyone was seeking an exemption. And that's just a, a great illustration of the need to set up the right kind of campaign to accompany some of this work because some of it will get blowback and won't be initially appealing to people unless we've done the work to kind of build out the, the public relations campaign to accompany it. Yeah, you need a good hashtag these days, right? And a, <laughs> a t-shirt, you know, people talk about um, the simplicity of a good t-shirt campaign or a bumper sticker campaign, but they really do go a long way. And especially now where we have a generation, you know, Generation Z, that's so used to social media, they can really mobilize really quickly and get the word out so much quick, more quickly than we could have before, that that might be something to sort of think about, you know, in their, in their language, influencers, you know, if you get enough influencers on board to really connect people to a mission, it really drives, uh, drives things forward much more quickly. So I think it's, it's fascinating. Wow. So, so I wonder about how we can, you know, we, we think in terms of partnerships, um, how we can sort of inspire people to get on board, like we just talked about in a t-shirt campaign, um, you know, but what fields do you think may have unrealized or overlooked growth opportunity or potential as we think about the future and greenification? Are there anything that comes to mind, Michael, in your travels, perhaps? Yeah, well, and 
a question just came in that I want to address, which was, um, what's the top thing I should ask my city to implement in terms of sustainable real estate? And you know, there's a lot of leadership opportunities that cities can take, you know, and it depends somewhat on context and, and where the city is. But you know, there are even Republican mayors out of California, Lancaster, California, that mandated any new building that was being built had to have solar on top of it. And of course, that makes sense in California. And, and thinking about new mandates to set up, uh, but when it comes to a lot of the building work, it, I think, relies on a good story. And, you know, I try to tell my story as many times as I can with my solar and my power wall batteries and my heat pumps. But then I'll set this story within the outages that I get frequently when I move to Vermont. The first full week I stayed here, there was an outage for several days. And when I talk to Vermonters about the need to green our buildings, the solar, the power wall batteries, the heat pumps. I bake it within that story so that people get it right away. And then when I use the taglines or the memes around energy security and energy independence, which, which a lot of people can identify with and be attracted to, then they understand it. But I think buildings really need a, a good story. Um, and that, that needs to be accompanied by visuals and video. I think the thing about Gen Z, and I remember being at the Paris Climate Talks and sitting with a senior VP from Facebook who said rightly that the future is no text. The future is all video and visual, and we're, we're almost there already uh, in terms of how the younger generations are moving ideas. Ideas are moving primarily with video and visual. And so because of that, how do we take you know, if you look at any city site when it comes to climate work, they'll have a big PDF that you can download, the climate action plan, and it's like a 50 mega, whatever. It's a big document that you have to download and it's a it's PDF. It's not really beach reading, right? So Correct. <laughs> and so it's a big lift for these cities to think differently about engaging the public and even moving them from a master's or a PhD in, in some kind of environmental science to a change maker and a change agent and a mobilizer and an organizer, but that's what they need to do too. And how do we how do we translate all this in video and visual and tell a story so it's compelling for people? I strongly believe in storytelling. Um, yeah. Another question came in, uh, what US cities are you surprised are not participating in decarbonization or net zero goal setting? Oh, anyone in Florida. I mean, I'll, I'll say with a caveat, uh, Miami Beach, I've worked with a lot, and they've done some really compelling communications to their communities. Rising Above was a whole campaign that Miami Beach built to talk about rising above the incoming tide, sea level rise, storm surge, et cetera. And the city of Miami and Orlando and a bunch of other cities in Florida are actually leading in a way that the state is not. So where I'm surprised is less cities, because cities are really leading faster than a lot of states. It's the state of Florida that could be seizing its solar abundantly. And Florida Public um, FPL, Power and Light, uh, is just not harnessing the kind of solar that they could. I mean, they could be a, they could be raking in profits and exporting some of it to kind of the Southeast grid and just aren't. So where my surprise is, is really around uh, states and less so cities, because even Republican-led cities are leading on this stuff in way that in ways that Republican-led states aren't. So interesting, you know. great opportunity, right? Great yeah. space for opportunity. That's right. Um, so, Amy, do we have any other questions? I just noticed that we are already at two forty-five. I was afraid of this. I feel like we're at the tip of the iceberg on this conversation because there's so much action and strategy that we could talk about that we could really inspire a nation to really move toward or the globe really to move toward a space where we're all doing something because i think the behaviors that you talked about michael are so important that if people even make small changes i mean you hear this so often but it really really is very very true i mean i loved the um uh, Helsinki trash vacuums that you shared and showed, because that would be a really easy way of sort of understanding what goes where, right? Yeah, and they're fun. Like people are like, whoa, this is so cool, because it and then goes 60 kilometers an hour or something. Uh, no, it wouldn't be an hour. Amazing. Um, Amazing. But I think with, you know, Dennis, with Dennis's uh, illustration of buildings, and maybe Dennis, you have that and one, I'd love to see the videos unless they're only internal of the WWF kind of like, Winners. Um, <laughs> winners, winners, or I can make yeah. some of them available. Competition probably. videos. Yeah. I, would, yeah. I would love to see those. I, I love that. Yeah. And and I and I've seen some building owners do this. I know some Bloomberg's buildings did this, where they're creating videos, and and perhaps you have these too, Dennis, so that people can see inside these buildings if they can't work inside them. 
uh, and experience them and see how cool they are. Because I, I do think there's enough of a fascination with technology and, and people can get geeked out by it and like, look how cool, look how cool this building is. And, and as a side of side benefit it happens to be green. I mean, that's really what it is. Like, look how cool these buildings are and they yeah. happen to be great for the environment. Yeah. Yeah. We've actually done some of this, especially with COVID and not al allowing people to enter our buildings for, you know, uh, obvious reasons, um, virtual building tours. Um, we have this in our plants too, from a virtual support perspective um, in, in what we do on a, on a day to day maintenance perspective. So um, absolutely that the, the pandemic has actually increased some of those, those things. You know, one thing I wanted to just kind of circle back to in um, the uh, kind of the communication back and forth with like cities and, um, you know, uh, communication and social media and all these other kind of things. And I would really encourage people to do, um, I try not to leave these, these webinars ever without encouraging people to actually ask us about what it is that they're, they're looking for. Um, I'm, I'm sure cities would, uh, would appreciate you asking them and actually saying that, Hey, it would be great if there was a electric vehicle charging station here, or, What's the what's the uh, impact of this building? Companies, cities, whatever the organization might be, aren't going to act unless they know that people want the information, right? That it's important in some way. So, I, I again, I didn't want to leave here without um, encouraging people to do that. I know we have specifically done things in our company, specifically because an architect, a specifier, um, you know, a building owner has asked us, you know, what's the embodied carbon of that material? Years ago was, do you have a life cycle assessment for that material? What's the the uh, health impact of that? Do you have an H, uh, health product declaration? Um, you you have tremendous power in in asking, and I would even say that on the residential side of things, if you're building a house, looking to uh, improve your house in in some way, ask ask the manufacturer about these things. It it I can tell you it helps to be able to move the needle and move companies in a positive direction because they know it means something to their customers. Exactly right. And that's where, you know, um, that's where things really facilitate change when you start sort of challenging or having curiosities about what's in something, right, how it's made and how it's put together. So I love the San Gobain making the world a better home, because that's really how we sort of are going to make it make it make a difference in this world. So this has been such a terrific way of spending the afternoon and really broadening our conversation on climate crisis uh, with some truly attainable strategies that we just talked about and explored to move the ball forward for this cleaner future for generations to come. So gentlemen, I thank you so much for your time. And to our audience, please continue the environmental conversations that you're having in your regions of the world. And I will turn it back over to Amy to see if there's any last questions that I hadn't seen or to let us know about the next K-Talk for next month. Yes, thank you, Kimberly. So we did get a few more questions um, Great. in the Q&A. It looks like maybe we can get to a couple of them. I do wanna let everyone know we can always share these questions directly with our panelists, with Michael and Dennis. You know, we can keep the conversation going uh even beyond this webinar so <laughs> awesome. um one question that came in just now do you know any groups working with hospitals and health clinics seems like a great partnership with common goals somebody want to take that dennis i mean there there are hospital organizations that are very focused on on sustainability, human health, um, these kind of things. I mean, just one that kind of comes to mind, the Kaiser Permanente uh, system, like human health as it relates to the building materials is a big, ha has been for a long time a big focus um, for them. Um, you know, we, we've done case studies on things like acoustics and the impacts it has on the outcomes of, of, uh, of uh, you know, patients in hospitals. Uh, access to light, um, these these various things. I, I believe we have got some of these case studies actually on our website um, as well. So there's definitely information out there um, to be able to kind of make the make the connection here. Just a couple of points that I'm aware of. Awesome, great. And it looks like Michael also put some pointers in the chat as well. Great, thank you, Michael. All right, uh, let's see, any other questions? I just put in uh, the Q&A and I'll just share it here with folks. One of our city staff started this organization, Urban Drawdown, because there was a question in the Q&A 
function about Madrid and urban forest building. And so I wanted to identify this because more and more cities are recognizing the opportunities in terms of using soil in cities to draw down carbon uh, and of course forests as well. So you're seeing a scale and the New York Times has written about this, the opportunity uh, with soil and trees. And so it's kind of a no brainer, but Thankfully, there's a new found focus on uh, recognizing soil's capacity to draw down carbon and cities role in that, which is good. Amazing. And then someone asked, are any cities in Louisiana included in zero, she put LA, so I'm assuming that's Louisiana, including in zero emission planning. Uh, in New York, yes, New, York, New Orleans. So the Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance is an affiliate of the Urban Sustainability Directors Network, USDN.org, which is 200 plus cities in the US that are focused on sustainability, myriad goal setting from kind of low bar to high bar. And we have several cities uh, in Louisiana, New Orleans, definitely very involved in leading on these fronts. So uh, I do encourage folks to check USDN uh, let me just put it in here, usdn.org. Oh, didn't hyperlink, but you get it, uh, because that's the parent organization of the Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance, which the latter of which is more global. Great. Okay. Thank you. Well, I think that's about all the questions we'll have time to answer. At this time, again, we can share these questions with our panelists, um, continue the conversation beyond our webinar. So um, I just want to say thank you again to our guests, Michael Shank and Dennis Wilson, and to our moderator, Kimberly Smith. And of course, thank you to our audience for joining us for this Cave Talk. Um, a replay will be available on null.com in the coming days. And we'd also ask that you please save the date for our next Cave Talk, which will take place Tuesday, September 14th, when our topic will be um, who is the boss? Has the pandemic permanently shifted the talent dynamic? Join Null Workplace Research Manager Carolyn Cirillo in conversation with Steve Cadigan, author of Workquake, Embracing the Aftershocks of COVID-19 to Create a Better Model of Working. And they'll be talking about how the pandemic has shifted workplace talent conversation. More details and registration will be available on Null.com very soon. So thanks again, everyone. Please take care and we will see you next time. Thanks everyone. Thank thanks you. gentlemen. Thanks for having Bye -bye. us. Bye-bye.